So today's talk goes out to all the love birds. Enlighten me today with your East London romantic romantic lingo. Valentinus or Valentine is arrested and on this letter was written your Valentine. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the best at home, so tolerant and loving that other men they were saying to the prophet alpha male alpha lions uh, of arabia yeah those arab men very male chauvinistic society they were looking at the prophet and they were saying ya rasulullah you are making things very difficult for us bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala rasulillah ma ba'd a'udhu billahi samir ali min ash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin wa qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yu'minu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wan nas ajma'in aw kama qala alayhi salatu was salam respected brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So today's talk goes out to all the Valentinos, Casanovas, the Majnus and the Ranjas and the list goes on. All the love birds. Because a day is approaching soon, 14th of February, and some people have this idea that they can with convenience celebrate the Valentine's Day and express their love for the loved ones in particular romantic love to their beloveds uh in case of the muslims of course the only option is the halal option and other than that is all open you know it's open season so we want to talk about this particular celebration or this particular day yeah or this particular festival if you want to call it that nowadays it's a secular idea whereby having being influenced by the western culture in general and the american culture in particular people across the world they on the 14th of february express their love to their beloveds in particular female uh, or towards males of course right so in most cases this love is being expressed between two individuals of the opposite gender in most cases and it may be so that it is expressed otherwise but that's not what i am going to talk about today so what is the origin where does this idea come from why are people indulging in it do they even know the history of it do they know where it comes from whether it it is something normal for uh everyone else in the world to do in particular for muslims is it even an option these are the points i will be addressing today inshallah taala so cut the long story short cut 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 to the chase the day of valentines uh, or oh, the valentines day is celebrated on the 14th of february and people exchange flowers and cards and express their love for the opposite gender and the idea actually originates from pagan rome there was a festival called lupercalia which was celebrated by pagan romans so this was a festival pastoral festival whereby people would get together at the beginning of uh spring when spring would come after autumn or winter okay and people would get together to celebrate the coming of uh the spring and when they would be celebrating they would do a number of things for example they would uh sacrifice animals to this god of fertility called lupercus hence the name lupercalia they would slaughter animals like sheep and dog right and they would take blood from these animals and they would be splashing this blood uh on young females so that they can be fertile 
this is for fertility and then they would play games of erotic nature there would be uh, there would be sexual deviance all over the place romans are very loose with their culture those who have studied roman history you would know that romans are very loose with these things greeks more so before them right uh, that's why you so, see so many uh, sculptures and uh, statues from the roman period that are naked right if you go to the british museum you will see roman uh, sculptures and statues you will see that they didn't have this concept of shame and honor you may have today as muslims so in order to understand the roman psyche you must go into their times and see what what culture they were following and what religions they were following and what actually formed their norms if you like right you as a muslim you might look at something from the roman period and you say astaghfirullah yeah this is absolutely absurd okay but for them it was normal they grew up in this culture so they would play these games they would uh put like they would do a lottery for women and men they would put the names in a box and they would pick pick, pick these names randomly and then have relationships with each other uh, uh, having sexual uh, intimacy with infants was also involved things like this a lot of uh deviant practices or perverted practices would be the norm on this day the 15th of february they did this the middle of february so this is where the origin comes from now why was it called the valentine's day is the question now why valentine's day so this festival would be celebrated throughout the roman empire and then as we all know or those of you who know that the roman empire eventually became christian in particular the 4th century when emperor constantine accepted christianity or converted to christianity the roman empire predominantly uh, started to profess christianity as its religion and many roman generals even emperors dignitaries senators uh, you name it they became christian a lot of the pagan festivals or pagan celebrations became christianized during the christian period for example another example is christmas you said it right christmas has pagan origins christmas was celebrated on the 25th of december as the day of the sun god sol invictus sol invictus was the sun god even worshiped by constantine the great if you pick up roman coins from his period where you find his bust his uh, image on the coin on the one side on the other side the obverse or the reverse you will see uh, a human figure carrying a globe and that was the sun god they used to worship sol invictus so they used to celebrate this god on the 25th of december and then christians later on changed their celebrations to this day to commemorate the birth of jesus christ allegedly so even christmas has pagan origins and there is no debate on that particular question even christian scholars have written extensively on this point you can google a particular scholar called oscar kulman Oscar Kulman has written on Christmas. If you Google his name and the word Christmas, you will see an article written by him where he explains the the origins of Christmas. Likewise, Valentine's Day is another example, a festival which was uh, celebrated throughout the Christian period and later on and to this day. it's a culture pr- practice now it's not necessarily religious but has pagan origins almost satanic or- origins i mean if you look deeply if you go further deeper into the origins of this particular festival called lupercalia you will find that many of the practices actually originated from previous cultures such as the greek mythology and beyond some people claim it goes back as far as nimrod okay to babylon 
So some of these practices can come from the ancient world and these satanic rituals and celebrations and uh, festivals actually have satanic origins. And later on, they were beautified with red flowers, with a little baby with wings shooting an arrow, right? Yeah, all of this, it was kind of beautified, right? But the origins are pagan. Even that little figure has pagan origins, okay? That little infant with wings shooting an arrow through the heart basically is the child of Mercury and Venus. Mercury is the messenger of God, Roman gods and Venus is the goddess of love. So this is the outcome. The, birth, the child is basically uh, the child of these two Roman deities. And you might have seen this figure very often on Valentine cards. You might have seen it, right? The baby with wings. So it's not an innocent mistake. It's not an innocent uh, figure that's being used. Even that has pagan origins. So why Valentine's Day? Why was it called the Valentine? Historically speaking, Christians have argued about a person called Valentinus, who was a Roman citizen and he lived during the reign of Emperor Claudius II, okay, in the mid third century CE, 260s, let's say, 260s, right? When Roman persecution was at its peak, one of the worst persecutions to have taken place against Christians who believed in one God, not necessarily Trinitarians at that time, were heavily persecuted. They were killed off. One particular reign or one particular emperor during his reign, a lot of destruction was witnessed of Christians, of their places of worship, their scriptures. Um, many people were executed for not paying, paying respects to pagan gods because this particular emperor called Decius, D-E-C-I-U-S, Decius, he persecuted Christians living within the Roman Empire severely. And Ibn Kathir, uh, Ibn Kathir alayhi, when discussing the issue of Ashabul Kahf, also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, Ibn Kathir alayhi, proposes Decius as an option when this persecution took place, when these youngsters who were being persecuted, who were being forced into shirk and to save their iman. They took refuge in a cave somewhere and you know what happened, right? You know the story of Ashab al-Kaf, the seven sleepers of the cave, so-called, the so-called seven sleepers of the cave, right? So in the Arabic language, he's called the Qiyanus. In Latin, his name was Decius. And this is the time when this was happening. Decius was succeeded, succeeded by one of these emperors called Claudius II. And he needed Roman soldiers to join the army because the, the empire was going through a sharp decline. So he needed more and more men in the army. And according to the Roman law, married men could not join the army because they would have to leave their women behind. And for that reason, they couldn't join the army. So he needed more and more uh, bachelor men to remain bachelor so that they can join the army. At that time, a Christian called Valentinus or Valentine, he started to get some Roman citizen married in secret. So if a Roman youngster fell in love with a woman and he happened to be or she happened to be Christian, Valentinus or Valentine would facilitate the marriage for them. And they would get married in secret. It wouldn't be declared publicly because it was a crime. He, what he was doing was a crime, according to the law. Not morally speaking, but legally speaking, it was a crime. Long story short, Claudius found, found, finds out and he is arrested. Valentinus or Valentine is arrested and put on trial, tortured, eventually killed, beheaded or tortured to death. Different stories come from the church. Church historians have written about him and they all differ. 
there are three Valentinuses or three Valentines. They don't know which one is which, but there is this story attributed to him, just like the stories of the Gospels. There is, there is difference among the Gospel authors, even on the issue of Jesus Christ, how he lived and what he did and his ministry and all that. So if Jesus, they couldn't be united on, the four Gospel authors, imagine someone else who came later on who was far less important than Jesus himself. Okay, so now the year and the date that's given to the death of Valentine is 14th of February, 269 CE. And before Valentine is thought to have died, he, uh, he wrote a letter to a blind girl who was the daughter of the judge or the jailer of Valentine. She was blind and she was healed by a miracle or by the prayers of Valentine. And then one of the last acts he did was to write a letter with a heart cut out of paper or vellum and on this letter was written, your Valentine. Your Valentine, hence the term your Valentine on your cards nowadays. Allah protect us. Okay, so later on the Catholic Church in the 5th century, Pope uh, Gisilius, he decided to canonize Valentine, whichever that Valentine was, one of the three options, they canonized Valentine as a saint for upholding the sanctity of marriage in those difficult days when it, it was almost impossible to get married according to the Roman law. So that's why he was, you know, he was sanctified. He was declared to be saint. And then the 15th of February, the festival of the Procalia was basically exchanged with 14th of February, the day Valentine died in the year 269 CE. And then basically the new celebration of the new day celebrating the sanctity of love through marriage replaced the old Roman custom of Leprocalia, which was celebrated on the 15th of February, just like what happened with Christmas. The day, the 25th of December, uh, the, the day of sun god or Sol Invictus was replaced by uh, the Christian feast for Jesus Christ, which was usually celebrated on the 1st of January, but that day was moved five days or six days backwards to the 25th of December to bring the pagans and the Christians together. So this is a short history of the Valentine's Day. So for a Muslim in particular, this is not an option. Even to express love for your wife on this day and with your wife you are in a halal relationship, let alone a haram relationship which is out of the question. Even to express love to your wife on this day to give a card or to give a red rose to your wife may constitute, if not kufr, major sin definitely. Because if you don't know what the consequences are, if you don't know the history, then there is other bil jahl for you. Then you're jahil, you don't know. You're just following the culture, the urf, right? But you need to know where this urf is coming from. That's why Muslims in particular must abstain from celebrating festivals and days and holidays that they don't understand and know. And the easiest thing for a Muslim is to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. We have two festivals. We have two days of celebration every year. And what are they? Eidul Adha and Eidul Fitr. Eidul Fitr, Eidul Fitr comes first, of course, and then comes Eidul Adha. Okay, these are the two days. Any third Eid or called Eid is not an Eid. Okay, people try to bring up this argument that Juma. The Prophet ﷺ called it Eid. There is a linguistic meaning of Eid, the term Eid. And there is a technical meaning of the word Eid. The word Eid in the Arabic language means something that returns. And Jummah returns every week. So in that sense, Jummah is an Eid, linguistically speaking. But technically, Istalahan in Sharia, Sorry, uh, in, sh in Shari terms, not Istalahan. Istalahan is basically the linguistic meaning. In Shari terms, in Sharia, Eid, there are only two. 
There is no third or fourth or fifth Eid. So if someone comes to you with another festival called Eid, be sure or rest assured that it is not Eid. It could be anything else. Because the Prophet ﷺ, who was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gave us only two days to celebrate. There is no third day in Sharia to celebrate. Period. So if we stick to Islam, if we stick to our principles, our values, without compromising our faith and our culture, we will be on safe grounds. The moment you step outside, then there is a world open to you to all sorts of pagan festivals, pagan ideas, pagan things, perverted things and all sorts of things. Then there's nothing stopping you from becoming closer and closer to shaitan and his way. That's why the Quran is very clear. What is there after the truth? What is there after the truth? Misguidance. Once the truth has come to you, you stand by it. So that's why wishing your wife on the day of Valentine or the Valentine's Day with a card or with a flower is not an option for a Muslim. Islamically speaking, it is haram to do that because of the origin, because of the pagan origins of the festival. Okay? So this is very, very clear. This is not an option. Now, what is an option for us? What is the Muslim equivalent of the Valentine's Day, every single day, every single day. If you're a married man, that is the only way you can express love to the opposite gender. Now, there are types of love in Islam. Let me quickly go through them and then I'll come to this particular love I'm talking about. Love through marriage or love after marriage, not before marriage. That's not love, that's lust. Before marriage, you may call it what you like, a crush, fancy. What other words can you think of? Go on, enlighten me today with your East London romantic, romantic lingo. Yeah, go on. What other words are there? Crush, fancy, huh? Sorry? PR. So I'm talking about your East London or London or let's say Western terminology. If we, were, if we want to expand our horizons to the rest of the Western world, what other words people use for attraction for the opposite gender before marriage, right? All these words are there, right? All these words, are there. these are not options for a Muslim. These are expressions from shaitan. These feelings are from shaitan. Okay, it is lust. It is not a valid relationship. A valid relationship for a Muslim man and a woman is after marriage. But before we get to that, I want to go through the concept of love in Islam in general. What is it? What does it constitute? Number one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the topmost. Your love for Allah must take precedence over all types of love. Is that clear? Repeat after me. Our love, our love, this is not the Shahada by the way. Our love for Allah takes precedence over all other types of love. Is this a correct statement? If you disagree with me, disagree with me now. Don't grab me afterwards uh, outside the masjid. Right? So this is our love. If you ask a Muslim who is knowledgeable about his faith, about the epitome of, epitome of love, the peak of love, the best type of love, or the best expression of love, then you will say without hesitation, for Allah, to Allah. Who do you love? Allah. If you don't know this, know this today. Your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must take precedence. It is over. It is afdal. It is beyond your love for anything or anyone else in this world or in this universe. Period. This is a Muslim. Why? 
it is very logical this makes sense in fact only this makes sense why because he is your creator he made you he gave you everything he gave you your lives your health your wealth your families your environment your everything all the blessings you enjoy and you possess in this life are given to you by your lord your creator allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in multiple places in the quran and through the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that if you do not love allah more than anyone or anything else then you are lacking in iman that's allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this very very clearly in the quran a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim qul in kuntum tuhibbun allah fattabi'uni yuhibbukum allah wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wallahu ghafurur rahim allahu akbar o muhammad o prophet say if you love allah which is a condition of iman you must love allah if you profess belief in allah if you love allah then obey me the messenger of allah tell them your followers that if they love allah the creator of the heavens and the earth then follow me and then in return allah will love you and forgive your sins because allah is forgiving and merciful this is the quran so your love for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be unmatched intellectually physically and even when you express your love by, with your tongue okay your love for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is that love which drives you to obey allah and his messenger if there is no love for allah there is no obedience full stop and vice versa if there is no obedience to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no love the more you are obedient to allah the more you love allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is how it goes after allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself it is the messenger of allah this is the hierarchy of love in islam and obedience hierarchy of love and obedience in islam be very clear on this you the muslims wherever you are and even the non muslims who are listening be very clear that we the muslims we love our creator more than anyone or anything else in this universe we cannot love anyone more than that and after our creator the messenger of allah prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam why do we have to love muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam why do we have to love prophet muhammad this is to love allah because it is allah who sent him so when we love a king we love his messengers we love his people people who are close to the king right so allah is the king of kings and he sent messengers to respect allah to obey allah to take allah seriously we must take his messengers seriously and the last one of those is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he told us the prophet told us this is something disbelievers or non believers don't understand they find it difficult to understand you know when muslims get hurt when the prophet of islam is insulted people can't make sense of it they don't understand why do these people get upset he's just a human being right but they don't know it is a condition of our faith to love our prophet more than our parents children and all of mankind put together in sahih al bukhari kitab al iman we are told by the prophet himself the prophet of islam prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam stated la yu'minu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min waladihi min waladihi wa la la yu'minu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min waladihi wa wa walidihi wa nasi ajma'in you will not believe until i become more beloved to you than 
your parents, then your children, and all of mankind put together. You, the Muslims, must love the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if you believe. If you want to believe, and if you truly believe in Allah, then you must love the Messenger of Allah more than your parents, your children, and all of mankind put together. Why did the Prophet use the example of parents and children? You cannot possibly love anyone else more than them. Your parents you love because you grew up with them. From the moment you started to gain consciousness, you saw your mother and your father there for you, if they were alive. You saw your mother cooking for you, cleaning you, bathing you, taking care of you. Your father out in the field, making sure that you have food on the table, bringing clothes to you, making sure you have a shelter on top of you. Because before that you can't remember, when you were a baby, when you were an infant, you don't remember when your parents had sleepless nights. You as children, when you were children, none of you remembers. I can guarantee you, when you were one month old or two months old, you don't remember. When your mothers carried you at night, awake all night. I have children, I know. I have seen my wife going through these things. My children, some of them, they would cry at night and parents would be awake all night. Me and my wife would be awake all night, making sure the children are comfortable. Sometimes running to the hospital, if the child has the runny nose, if there's cough, or if there are signs of fever or something like that, children can easily get these things, right? Parents become very agitated, very, you know, anxious. Infants don't know that what the parents went through. Why is the level of the parents so high in Islam? Why are they so important? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly, after condemning shirk or describing tawheed, which is the topmost matter in Islam, what is the topmost matter in Islam? Tawheed, belief in one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He alone deserves to be worshipped. There is nothing beyond that in Islam. That is the first thing you believe in. After that, repeatedly Allah mentions birrul walidain. Birrul walidain. Kindness to parents. Why? Because what they go through to raise you. Right? So that's why the Prophet said, you cannot, if you are a sane person, if you're a fair person, if you're a just person, you cannot possibly love anyone more than your parents. And then the Prophet says, you have to love me more than them. And then children. The second option in this hadith, children. That you have to love the Prophet more than your children. Those of you who are parents, you know what it is like to love children. If your children get sick, you would pray to Allah, oh Allah, give me that sickness. If your child is suffering in front of you, Okay, I, I'm 44 years old and I had COVID in September 2021, I think, or not 22, I don't remember. Not this September, the September before I had COVID. I am 44 years old. My mother was like fish out of water. My mother, you know, men are strong. My father was trying to show a brave, you know, put up a brave face. You know, he could see me on drips and steroids and all sorts of things, you know, and I was finding it difficult to breathe at, at times and all that. My mother did not sleep for I don't know how many days. Even though I've pretty much lived most of my life. Right? And this shows you how much parents love their ch children. So the Prophet ﷺ said, that you, and this is why I'll come later to this point, how children turn around and pay back their parents is a very important point that we want to address tonight, inshallah, under this topic of the Valentine's Day. How some kids turn around and spit on the faces of their parents, literally disrespect them, disregard them, 
discard them don't even look at them for what for who some stranger who has done nothing for you whether it's a boy or a girl you will hurt your parents because of your feelings i have i've caught feelings for this person this is this is the idea this is this is the excuse this is what said when parents tell you no this is not a good idea parents who raised you they have life experience they know what's good for you what's bad for you if they tell you this is not good for you don't test it don't try it what's the usual response of caught feelings i can't live without her i can't live without him he's my life you know i don't have words subhanallah wallahi i've had jahiliya by the way yeah so i know what what it is to express anger in extreme words if i had words for these children who do this to their parents after what, what they went through for you for you i'll come back to that later inshallah taala so love for the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is after allah subhanahu wa taala and then come parents then come parents the prophet told us that your parents are your doors to paradise what will take you to paradise your love for allah and his messenger and then if your parents are alive they are potential doors to paradise they are your doors to paradise simple very simple formula in fact there are reports on the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not authentically worded or reported but uh, there are many reports in this regard that's why scholars believe that these reports collectively they are very very strong and they are in line with the the narrative narrative of the quran al jannatu tahta aqdam al ummahat and one of the hadiths of sunan abu daud that jannah is under the feet of both of them very often people mention the mother right the paradise under the feet of the mother right but there is another report in sunan of abu daud that both of them right why feet are the lowest part of human body right so the prophet is allegedly if this these reports are authentic and they can be traced back to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which to my knowledge they haven't been these this particular wording cannot be traced back to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we have other wordings similar wordings but if you think about it under the feet of your parents under your paradise is under their feet this love this is love in islam people you need to pay back people you need to pay respect to people you need to honor why allah created you the messenger made you aware of allah your parents gave you birth and then they raised you this is why a muslim cannot be someone who we call in the urdu language ihsan faramosh sheikh there is a, an arabic word for that khain khain maybe khain khain is the closest term i can think of in the arabic language someone who has no honor someone who has no honor who is that person who doesn't have any honor who does not acknowledge who does not acknowledge favors who is a khain a khain is a person someone did a favor to you and you turn around and pay them back with evil this is the worst creature walking on the planet you grow up and you say who is allah i don't know allah who is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam i don't have to follow who are you mom who are you dad get out of my way i don't know you i don't care about you you may not say this but by your actions you may do this if you knew the value of because we cannot allah allah is not visible to us the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died 1400 years ago i wish the prophet was here we could kiss his feet i wish he was here so that we can we could kiss his feet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
I wish he was here that we wouldn't allow him to put his feet on earth. We would put our hands underneath. We would put our bodies underneath so that he can walk on us. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But guess what? There is an option for us. There is an option for us. Our parents. They are a blessing that we don't realize how important they are to us. It's very important. So parents are third in the hierarchy. Then come your children. Then come your children. This is the Islamic concept of love. This is love in Islam. Properly guided. Properly directed. Love with honor. Real love. True love. Not the love that you love someone, you go to bed with them, six months down the line you realize, I'm bored. I'm not feeling it anymore. I don't have the same fun I used to have with you. I want to move on. How about giving half your property to me? Yeah, these rich tycoons, big, big guys recently, you saw, you, you saw what happened to Bill Gates. Love. Right? This is not real love. Any love that is not for the sake of Allah. And when you love someone, when you love someone, in Islam, for a Muslim to a Muslim, it has to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your love for the sake of Allah will be the most powerful form of love. It will never break. This is what keeps people together. This is where belief in Islam comes in. Belief in Islam keeps families together because they're not with each other for other things. For money, for other things, for example, anything. It could be anything. They are together for the sake of Allah so that Allah is not angry with them. They don't leave each other. They put up with each other. They are patient with each other. They look at the virtues, the good deeds, the good, good things, the good qualities, not the bad qualities. And they stay together for the sake of Allah. That's true love. That's real love. Because it is guided by your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But any other type of love, it will have something. It can easily be broken. It can be removed. It can change. It can fluctuate depending on the situation and the circumstances. Okay, I'm not saying people don't stay together for genuine feelings for each other. Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. People do have feelings with each other and they spend their lifetimes with each other. They die with each other. Okay? But in the real world, these stories you read in books about a man lusting, I mean, I don't, let's not call it lust. You know, a feeling of attraction. Call it a feeling of attraction. However you want to define, you want to call it platonic attraction or you want to call it physical attraction. You want whatever name you want to give it to. Uh, give, 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 uh, uh, you know, whatever name you want to give it, uh, give it. But the reality is, how long is it going to go for? Is it real? Is it going to last? And why is it important? Why does a man or a woman become the focus of your life. And a lot of the times, when people are heartbroken, it is because they have no connection with their creator. They have lost the plot. Their priority in life is misplaced. There are people dying out there who need your help. And you're lying on a street corner with a bottle in your hand to express your love Indian movie style. Yeah? With a bottle or if you want to go British, maybe spliff in your hand. Yeah? And if you have some money, then maybe sniffing cocaine. Whatever. People have found creative ways to overcome grief. Right? Caused by what? Heartbreak. Heartbreak. Because a woman or a man, you could not get, get them. You, can, you could not be with them, right? But is this why you were created? Is this the best use of your life? That you couldn't be... There are 3 billion women out there 
and three billion men, let's say if they are equal, right? You couldn't find someone else to be with. You only found one woman to be in love with. And if you couldn't be with her, you're going to die now. You're going to go and commit suicide. You're going to jump in front of the train. You're going to take poison. You're going to eat tablets, right? You're going to drink to death. Am I making these things up, brothers? You're too young to know these things. Am I making these things up? Have you heard stories? Heartbreak, suicide, injections. Some people even put the bullet in the head, commit suicide. They go in front of the they go in front of the beloved and then they put the gun to their head and then shoot, pull the trigger over a man or a woman. Easily replaceable. And it's only inside you that you think there's no one like him. There's no one like her to hell with you. You're blind. You're blind. Open your eyes and look carefully. There are billions of human beings. Same blood, same skin, same bones, same structures. We're not asking you to go to a gorilla. There are human beings around the world. You can love someone else. The halal way. The problem with this love, what causes people to commit suicide and go into depression and start taking drugs, it is haram love. Or it is not even love. It is a feeling of rejection that causes people to go into depression. Because they couldn't get what they want wanted, they go into depression. It's like a spoiled child. Right? You take a child to a toy shop, the child wants to buy the whole <laughs> shelf. You don't buy the shelf for the child, the child's going to cry and flip and go ecstatic. What are you going to do with that ch child? You can try to, to reason with that child, right? But the child is not listening. It's going crazy. So this love is misplaced, misguided, destructive. I would say illegal in Islamic terms. This love. Now there are other social consequences of such love. This Valentine love, what we call, you know, relationship out of marriage. Mostly that's the case. Because Valentine, how many people actually give flowers to their wives? <laughs> Come on. After you've lived with a woman for a year, you're looking for another one. I mean... I'm not saying all people are like that, but there are many people like that out there, especially what's happening in the world today. There's so much promiscuity, there's, there's so much fitna and temptations and distractions and social media expectations have been raised. Men are watching these things and women are watching these things and they're getting aroused and they're not being satisfied by the existing partners and they go out and they look for more and more satisfaction and more and more perversion, more and more depression, more and more dissatisfaction. Right? So how many people you see giving flowers and cards? Very few maybe. Very few to their wives. It's mostly, you know what? It's a billion dollars industry. In the US, some years ago, they were making up to 20 billion dollars on the, the 14th of February, this day, selling cards and flowers. It's a billion dollars industry. Promoting what? Illicit relationships. Temporary relationships. And what comes from it is the question. N not in all cases. Again, I'm not a reductionist. I'm not generalizing. I'm speaking about the norms as I see them. And I can be corrected. I'm not arrogant. I'm not, I'm not saying what I'm saying is entirely true. But I'm expressing my observations. From Latin America to Asia to Africa to Southeast Asia to China to Russia, on this day when people express their love, it is mostly outside of marriage. And most of these relationships don't last very long. Temporary love. That's why I call it lust. Once the lust is over, the relationship is over. 
and very often what happens what is the outcome children outside a wedlock fatherless children mostly fatherless not motherless because mothers don't usually abandon the children fathers do men father children with women and walk away and then you are left with fatherless children and you know what that is that's your worst nightmare that's your worst nightmare these are the ones who grow up to be gangsters drug dealers and all sorts of things most abusers serial killers child molesters pedophiles and gangsters and criminals most i'm not saying all most they come from what broken homes broken families disturbed backgrounds this is your valentine's day like it or lump it this is what it does i'm not saying all cases i'm not saying all cases but there are because we have fatherless children in millions in millions i'm saying relationships that begin like this they end like that they usually end like that okay there's no serious commitment that's why in islam we the muslims we commit to a relationship by using the name of allah making allah our witness that oh allah i take this woman into my house by your blessings oh allah these people these muslims are witnesses to the fact that i am taking this woman into my house with respect and honor and i have to live with her honorably i have to take care of her and when i have children with her i will take care of those children i will be a father to them i will make sure that i am in their lives it is very possible that these marriages might break but in most cases they don't although divorce rate has rate has gone up recently because of uh i would say predominantly a lot of the things that are happening on these cell phones and social media and all those things they, 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 these these devices are causing breakups families are breaking apart because of these devices because of what's going on in in these devices and then that that's a lecture in itself right the point is this kind of love is not what we are supposed to do and that's why we have to make allah our witness so you know when a person gets married to a woman and then there is the islamic way of announcing it doing the walima there is peer pressure there is social pressure that's why so you can't get married in secret islamically speaking a woman a girl cannot just leave home and get married and live with him this is not allowed islamically speaking you know why because she may be abused and it happens it happens she may be thrown around she may be left with a child or two right this is why islamically speak islam protects women women islam protects them against abusive men men who may have ill intentions they may want to use a woman but they cannot easily get away with it because of social pressure because of the involvement of the family in the involvement of the masjid or the community everyone sees the guy this is the guy our girl is going to so you better keep an eye on him he's not going to go and mess around he's not going to do anything publicly because the people will hold him hold him accountable so a woman in islam is protected by the community by the entire community not on the fa- on, not only the family but the community but wh- where is the guarantee where are such guarantees outside of islam is the question what happens to all these hundreds of thousands of women who have m- children with different men three four children with different men i'm not saying muslims are perfect of course there is abuse happening within the muslim community no doubt no doubt but it is not on the same level as it is outside of islamic communities 
That's my claim. Because within the Muslim community, there's a mechanism, there is a process that has to be followed that protects women. So that's why in Islam, every day is Valentine's Day. Not the same name, we don't use the same term, but how do we know this? When a man takes a woman into his house, he gets married to her, what did the Prophet tell him? This is a man who is a Muslim who believes in Allah and his messenger. And what did the messenger tell him? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The best of you are those who are best to their wives. The term is Ahl, which is usually used for wives in the Quran and the Sunnah. Ahl. The best of you are those who are best to their wives. And those of you listening to me right now, Remember that. You will be judged by the way you treat your wives. Okay? And Islamically speaking, a Muslim man, he has to treat his wife with love, compassion and mercy. Has to be responsible. Has to make sure that she's comfortable. She has everything. Can't be negligent. Can't put her through suffering. This is the real way of being loving to your partner. Your opposite gender. The person you're living with. Right? Your husband or your wife. It works both ways. In Islam, a wife has to respect her husband. Honor him. Treat him well. For his sacrifices. And likewise, a husband has to be loving and compassionate to his wife. It is obligatory. Mistreating one's wife is not an option. It is absolutely, utterly haram. And it is a big problem in some Muslim circles. People, when they get married, they become Saddam Hussein or Don Corleone with the gun on the table, sitting like this at home. Okay? This is the attitude some people have. In particular, some Muslim men. Okay, this is not a relationship between a slave and the master. No, this is a partnership. Okay, look at the way the Prophet ﷺ treated his wives. He had young wives, he had elderly wives. The youngest was Aisha radiallahu anha. The Prophet ﷺ, he married her and the Prophet was an example for humanity. He had to show how you live with these women. And these women, they became... The biggest proponents of Islam. So honored they felt by Islam that they are the ones who became the biggest flag bearers, torch bearers, proponents of this faith. If they saw the Prophet behave differently at home and they saw hypocrisy in his character, they would know this man is an imposter. But the Prophet ﷺ was the best at home. So tolerant and loving that other men, they were saying to the Prophet, the ex, you know, alpha male, alpha lions uh, of Arabia. Yeah, those Arab men. Extremely haughty and uh, very male chauvinistic society. They were looking at the Prophet and they were saying, Ya Rasulullah, you're making things very difficult for us. How are we going to live with our women? You're making them brave against us. And the Prophet ﷺ would explain to them that this is Allah's trust in your hands. Their parents put them in your hands so that you take care of them. And amazingly, the last advice of the Prophet ﷺ in Hajjatul Wada, Allahu Akbar, the last sermon, this is prime time. This is the prime time. What is the Prophet telling them? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prime time. You know when, when is prime time? When most people are watching. Yeah, that's prime time, right? This is the largest gathering of the followers of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one place. Hajjatul Wada. The last sermon of the Prophet to the largest number of his followers in one place. At Hajj in Mecca. A hundred thousand of his followers. This is his chance to deliver the message. 
okay he goes through rules and regulations certain injunctions in islam then he talks extensively about the rights of women rights of your wives in particular and he says oh believers fear allah fear allah about your women fear allah about your women allahu akbar why would he say that if he was only concerned about men in islam for them to be happy he would be focusing on men but the prophet is focusing on the more vulnerable gender socially speaking in particular in those societies right women relied on men so the prophet said fear allah be very careful about their rights and then he talked about dawa those who are present go and take this message to those who are absent sallallahu alaihi wasallam So now having heard this my brothers and sisters those of you out there in the world if you feel that a man or a woman is more important than Allah and his messenger and your parents then all i say is that may Allah guide you may Allah wake you up may Allah get you to realize that how important this life is how much of a blessing from Allah this life is and if you're wasting it putting it putting it putting it into the hands of a person who is not deserving of it then may Allah guide you then you are to blame don't blame Allah and the worst type of ungratefulness to Allah is when you take your own life over a man or a woman if you desire someone there are halal ways to get to them go to your parents and i talk to parents i advise parents if your children come to you and they want to do things the halal way and you don't see anything wrong with the 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 prospect don't deny it don't be stubborn if you don't have any reasons to deny reject don't reject because you are going to cause the destruction of your children and my advice to children in particular our women our sisters our girls is don't abandon your parents for some guy who you who just who you just came to know for few weeks or few days your parents they went through a lot of difficulties and challenges to raise you my sisters my daughters who are listening to me right now out there your parents they went through a lot of difficulty if you look at what your fathers go through to raise you to work hard for you for you to have clothes and food and books even taking you to school do you think it's easy do you think it's easy and then you grow up and then you see a guy in college at uni or at the bus station and you start to have feelings for him and then your parents disappear from your memory you didn't think of them you didn't think of them there's nothing wrong with having feelings but you must control those feelings and direct them the halal way and this is for your protection this is not a hard line radical advice that you have to follow no this is the most logical advice that works to protect you to make sure that you live a happy life you have to go the right way the right way is choose a person as your partner who is deserving of you not someone you met in college um that person may well be deserving but do it the right way get your parents involved don't take things into your, into your hands and then when you are heartbroken someone comes along and uses you for their sexual needs because they desire you they lust after you they use you because you may be sincere you may be genuine in your love and your feelings but the other person is not genuine he may use you and walk away from you which happens in a lot and some of them are now making videos some of these girls are so naive that they fall in love with these guys the guys want nothing but uh gratification from their bodies and uh, you know they want to satisfy their lust they video them and 
these girls for some reason fall for people like this which sane guy will video you while having relations with you which normal person will do it? which person with good intentions will ever do it they are doing it to blackmail you they are doing it to use it against you this valentine of yours this casanova this ranja of yours he's a dog he's a shaitan because if he was sincere he would go to your parents to ask for your hand in marriage and then establish relations with you but what is he doing instead he takes you to a remote place quietly seduces you as what some would say grooms you and then videos you and uses those videos to get his friends involved too this is what's happening out there by the way this is what's happening out there if you watch news okay this is what's happening out there because of these devices these devices be very careful my sisters my daughters all women out there whether you are a muslim or a non muslim be very careful with guys with men who want nothing but gratification for the lust on that note i will stop and remember your parents when you are about to do something like this when you are about to kill yourself when you are about to go on drugs when you are about to go into depression over some guy or some girl remember your parents who deserve your love and attention more than some tom joe or or terry or abdullah or qasim or jay or ram okay whatever background you come from okay remember remember who raised you and why they raised you they didn't raise you for this so that you can find someone and then die for them who doesn't deserve your attention in the first place thank you so much for listening i hope this was a satisfactory treatment of the the valentines day topic now this day is coming up and when you see muslims indulging in it try to send this lecture to them inshallah we'll try to upload it as soon as possible so that you can send this lecture to them and tell them listen to it before you do something on this day okay um, and in particular you know when you're doing about to do something haram may allah protect all of us ameen ya rab wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin jazakumullahu khairan